Before I begin, I felt it was very important for me to continue uh, the share of last week because I felt that there were certain ideas that needed to be said and I hadn't said it. Uh, so basically this year is a continuation, part two, of the previous year, of the meaning of the war and how it uh, fits into the divine agenda. So this is really part two of last week's shir. Uh, before I begin, I just want to dedicate it that this shir should be a blessing and a merit for the health and success of the families of Regina Bas Yosef Reuven and Yeshaya Ben Yisrael, Ben Yamin Wolf, Ben Tzvi Hirsch, and Baruch Ben Ben Yamin Wolf. May the source of the shear certainly go for their merit. <clears throat> There's really a great deal to speak about, but my focus isn't, a, I'm not a reporter, uh, you know, uh, telling you the facts, because the truth is that <clears throat> we, all, we all know what's happening, uh, that since the Holocaust there hasn't been so many people killed, Jews killed, um, by a, a you know a terror organization, whatever. But what's so unusual about this, and I believe even the world, which usually in many ways is immune to the amount of people who die, and so that's how desensitized people are. But um, it's the way these people died. And if you hear some real graphic descriptions, I certainly do not recommend looking at any of this because it is so sadistic and heinous that you're not going to be able to erase it from your memory or your mind. And you don't want to have to think about this at any time. That's how bad it is. That's how, you know, how gruesome what the uh, Hamas did uh, and so on, you know. So uh, I, I certainly don't want to go into the graphic descriptions and so on, you know. But I think that the world, as, uh, as resistant they are to hearing about Jew to Jewish deaths and how little it means, basically, even if they don't admit it, um, <coughs> I think even they're shocked at, at what happened. So but my, my major I, uh, th idea is to integrate this, this war uh, in terms of the divine agenda. What could it possibly be in terms of what God wants to do and uh, what is exactly his rationale and what is he advancing with this? So that's a very important uh, analysis and so on. <clears throat> now what is important is really there are two histories of the world. We don't usually look at it that way, but basically that's the, the uh, framework from which I try always uh, to uh, combine. The first framework is the concept of Jewish history. Every nation has its history. Every nation has the events, the origin of the country or whatever the nation, and you know, the major events in the political system, economic systems, and so on that we know. Uh, United States, of course, has you know, U.S. history. and. Uh, and that's obviously very important to the nation, certainly, you know. But then there's a second aspect of history, and that is what is the progression of the divine plan? Now, what's interesting is to try to merge them. You see, we have, we, we have specific events, let's say, in the United States, but how do we merge that with the divine agenda? Certainly in uh, the, the, the history of the Jewish people, right, how do we merge that with the history, so to speak, of the divine agenda? And that's a real challenge, obviously, because we cannot interview God. Although, in a certain sense, he has been interviewed in that way, and that is the Torah. The Torah says, you know, in many ways, what he says, and what he thinks, and what he wants to do. But the difficulty, obviously, is that the Torah does not, most of the time, present the rationale of why does he want to do that? In other words, what does he want to accomplish 
with this particular event and why is it happening and so on. So in any case, so that's what I'm trying to do is really merge these two histories, so to speak, you see. Now as such, um, the history of the divine agenda together with the history of the Jewish people has many stages. Now let's take a look at the first five. Okay. Obviously what God wants, and I'm going to skip obviously a lot of ideas, and a lot of the ideas I've already said in many, many of the shurim uh, that I've given over the years, uh, which is really sort of like all the, not all, but a great deal of the pieces of Jewish history and of the divine agenda, and so on, you see. But clearly one of the major ideas of the, uh, the stages is what is the agenda of God in the sense of well, what does he really want? And I've explained that in many, many ways and so on. Uh, but clearly one of the things that God wants is that there's a tikkun process. God has a specific purpose and that is to re-enter the creation in a basic display of who he is. You see? And what he can control and what his attributes are. That's what he wants. He decided to conceal that, right? And he wants the actions of Jews, certainly in the last couple thousand years, to bring him back. So that is the process of tikkun. Tikkun means rectification, repair, or restoration. So God wants to repair that deficiency in the creation. He wants to re-enter the world and so on. But he needs to, whoever he's going to designate, the ones who do this, right, he needs to have their acceptance. You know, he doesn't want to force it on them, but he needs to have them accept it, which is what the Jews did. Uh, so the story of Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah, and so on, really is the acceptance by the Jewish people, basically, that they accept the job of the Tikkun process. So that became a real transaction, so to speak, where we do His will, we bring Him back, and the reward of that is we get to see Him and enjoy whatever ex that experience will give us, which is infinite bliss eternally. So that's a transaction, so to speak, between the Jews and the Rabbanu Shlodim. You see, so that's the first stage is where the Jews accept the process. Uh, then the next thing, of course, is who's the one who accepts it, basically. I don't want to repeat myself in terms of who Adam Horishan was. He was a human being, he wasn't Jewish, but like I said many times, Adam Horishan was a Yisrael. Because the Yisrael, right, is not a person specifically identified with a, um, uh, a forebear or an ancestor, right? It's not genealogical in nature. It's more of a ability that whoever is designated Yisrael can do the tikkun, which means he can bring God back through his acts and so on. <coughs> so the first one, basically, who does accept this is Avraham Avinu. He's the first Jew who is also, of course, a Yisrael. So he has that ability to do the tikkun. You see, so it's Avraham Avinu. As such, I want to mention two very important ideas which are, will come to bear in terms of certainly the, the understanding of this war between the Jews and the terror organization called Hamas. There is a certain concept called Hamagas Yichud. What is that? There are different acts of God. In other words, the behavior or the actions of God can be predicated basically on certain ideas. One of them is that God insists, so to speak, that there must be a nation in the future world, which is the world of reward, right? It has to be. The will of God refuses to allow the uh, possibility that no nation will have completed the tikkun and therefore does not get the future world. 
So there are a series of actions that God takes that will guarantee, you see, that uh, the pre people who do the tikkun must survive to do the tikkun. That's called the anhogas ayichud. It is the acts of God or the actions of God, right? In which God displays his complete supremacy over all ideas, which means he's not subject to anything except of what he wants to do, you see, which is a very important idea. <clears throat> In any case, what is interesting is that this Hanhoka, or these series of actions that guarantee that there will be a people who is the subject of this. And the answer is mankind. <clears throat> In the beginning, it was basically Odom Harishim. So what that meant is that even if Odom Harishim sins, which he did, and deserves death or annihilation or whatever, right? The nation that is designated Yisrael, which is his, uh, his offspring and so on, must continue to exist to do the tikkun. But it was on all mankind. It wasn't on any specific individual, you see, or on any specific nation. It means somebody in mankind has to survive. So in a certain sense, the subject was anybody, right, that would want to do uh, this tikkun methodology. <clears throat> so God finally realized, in that sense, not that he realized, but he saw that the only one who was doing this consistently, engaging in this tikkun process by doing the will of God, is Avraham Avinu, after 2,000 years. Avraham Avinu was 52 years old when the world turned uh, 2,000. So he therefore decided, I'm, I'm leaving out a lot of stuff, that he's going to make an agreement with Avraham Avinu. And what is that agreement? That uh, I'm going to give you the ability to bring me back, right? And you're going to get a reward and so on and so on, you know? And of course, this is brought down uh, in Bracious, in Lech Lecha, as part of what's called the Brisbane Absurum, the covenant between the pieces. And that's where Avraham Avinu had this dream, it's really prophecy that he had, and so on, uh, where he goes into this agreement with God. But what's interesting is Avraham Avinu said to the Rabbanu Shlodim, Bomo Eida, okay, I understand this is the deal you want to make with me. In other words, I will do your will, do, get engaged in the Tikkun process, and you will give me the land, you will give me Ilam Habo, and so on. But the problem is what? Is that the guarantee that somebody must survive in Ilam Habo is not against me or my kid. Uh, you know, it doesn't refer to me or my children and so on. It doesn't refer to Jews, it refers to mankind. So technically speaking, if we sin, which means we don't do your will, what can happen, therefore, is what? Is that you will destroy us just like you destroy the entire world, mankind, right? And then Nanhogas HaYichud only directed itself against or for Noach and his children. So what guarantee do I have that if my descendants do, do not do your will, that the guarantee says that they will be in the future world? No guarantee at all. Somebody's going to have it anywhere in mankind. So what the Bosham said to him, which is interesting, okay, for the first time in history, the Anogas HaYichud will guarantee that there has to be somebody that we know in general, but that somebody is going to be you and your descendants. <coughs> so th that's an incredible victory that the Jews are guaranteed that they must survive see, as a nation, in Oilam Habo, which was great, you see. <clears throat> but then the question is what? Well, what happens if they sin? So God gave him a choice, which is interesting. Justice has to be satisfied. I talked about this, the concept of punishment, you know, on the Yom Kippur Shia, which I just gave recently, where you have to undo whatever you create. So justice isn't so much about retribution. It's really about discreating whatever you do. That's the concept of din, 
justice or measure for measure and so on, you know. So that's what it has to be. So the Rebbe gave Avraham Avinu, the Chazal tell us, a choice. I can either satisfy justice, right, if they don't repent, that is. If they repent, fine, then justice is satisfied. But what if they don't? So I can do one of two things. Either I can give them Gehenim or exile, Golas. You see? Now, there's obviously a very big difference because Gehenna comes after you die. So the problem is after you have expiated all your sins, you're still dead and you ain't coming back, as they say. So you don't have a chance, really, to renew your life in a way that you've sort of like satisfied justice, right? But if it's exile, right, then you could do tshuva because exile will make you suffer, whatever, if that's what's required. And you can then continue your life in a new path. Uh, so Avraham Avinu said, no, I don't want Gehenna, right? That's not what the guarantee is where they have to undo the sins. I want exile. In other words, if my people, the Jews, in those days they were called the Hebrews, right? If they sin, then you will uh, incorporate the punishment uh, uh, of, of exile. Uh, you see, so exile became firmly implanted as the method to undo sinning if the Jews do not repent, and so on. So that was a very important thing that Avraham Avinu accomplished. Two things I mentioned. One is that the the guaranteed backup system, goes on the Jews. And the second thing is that the form of satisfying justice is exile, not Gehenna. That doesn't mean you don't get Gehenna, but it, that's not the major way of Kapara or atonement and so on, you see. Uh, so Avram Avinu, uh, besides making an agreement with God, which is incredible, all right, uh, he affected those two very important ideas. So therefore exile is what? Is exile. Uh, you see, <clears throat> what does exile mean? And that is that uh, we will suffer in many ways, you know. So we're talking not only about personal suffering, right, which is poverty, sickness, divorce, or ba bankruptcy, whatever, all the many different forms of, of uh, suffering and so on, you know, uh, family problems and so on. But exile means also to, to be under the domination of other nations that will make us suffer in different degrees, right? The mere fact that we are in other nations automatically subjects us to their value system, which automatically makes it much harder to remain faithful as a Jew because we are immersed in their value system. Much more difficult and so on, you see. Uh, so that's the concept of exile. Then if that nation decides to persecute us in different ways, they do not allow us to, you know, have economic freedom, which is what they did in the Middle Ages and so on, right? Or they kill us. There are all kinds of things. Once you're under the domination of other nations, all kinds of things that can occur and so on. We are watching this form of satisfying justice right now with the Ishmael, with the Arabs or the Muslims. That's really what it's all about. Do not think that what's the logic of all this. This is one of the ways, right, that God will satisfy justice, you see, because there are a tremendous amount of heavenly prosecutions, you see, that the Satan, the Satan, right, the prosecuting heavenly district attorney and so on, right, is submitting the Jews to it, to it too, and so on. So automatically, you have to understand that this war is part of the divine agenda in terms of exile, in terms of golos. It's really what it is. Now, we don't understand what form it takes, why God does it now, which Jews does God select for them to be killed, in what manner, 
All of this is beyond what we know. We obviously don't know. In the end, they will all be revealed. But right now, we have no idea. And what's key, obviously, is always remember, nothing is unjust in the divine agenda. We don't know how or why, but that's where it is. So everything is justified based on the desire of God to get every Jew into Ilm Haba, into the future world. It's all part of that Nagasi Yichud, and so on. <clears throat> uh, so that's a very important idea, to place this within the context of the divine agenda. A very important idea. Now, <clears throat> besides that, what else does this war conform to? And this is a very important idea that has a uh, definite historical origin, as we will, as I will now point out. <clears throat> you know, God appears to Moshe Rabbeinu in Egypt, or outside of Egypt, or whatever, and he tells Moshe Rabbeinu, you're the man, you're the Messiah. I want you to take the Jews out of Egypt. That's Mashiach. And then take them to Eretz Israel. And before that, of course, uh, to give them, uh, you know, Matan Torah, where they have to accept the totality of the written law and the oral law and so on, you know. And you're the one who has to bring it about <clears throat> and so on. You know, just as an aside, which is also very interesting, you know. Could you imagine most people at 80 years old, what they think about is getting the social security check. They want to retire. Do you know how difficult it is for a young person, let's say Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, let's say if he was 30 years old, and then the Moshe would appear to him. Could you imagine telling a person, I want you to take out, what does that mean? That means he, have to, he has to have youth, resilience, energy, right? He's got to have the cognitive ability, the smarts, right? To pull it off. To do what? He's got to confront Paroi. You know, Egypt is the greatest nation on earth. You know what it is to confront a pharaoh that people looked on as a god? The amount of resourcefulness, the energy that he's got to have? to engage with the entire Pharaoh and the Egyptian government, then he's got to contend with the Jews. You know, if it doesn't work, you know what that is? To, uh, to rule over a people that we know is Kshayorif, right? that is stiff-necked and so on, and if it's not going exactly the way they think, they're going to start complaining, which is exactly what they did. Then he's got to take them out of Egypt, right? And there was at least 2.4 million Jews, because we know there were 600,000 Jews over the age of 20, and so on. So we figure those people over the age of 20, right, they had uh, uh, a woman and two kids, probably. We're looking at millions of Jews. Imagine he's got to supply or worry about the needs of over two million people, you know, the energy, then he's got to take their complaints, right? Then he's got to get them protected as they go through hostile nations. Then he's got to give them the Torah. He's got to know the Torah. He's got to be a judge. I mean, I wouldn't give this to a 30-year-old, let alone an 80-year-old man, which is astounding when you think about that, <laughs> you know? and so on. But we see that what the Bershom did is he supplied him with incredible youth, as it says, you know, in the end of the Torah, that his eye never dimmed. Well, if his eyes never dimmed, I guarantee you the whole body never dimmed. He must have had the youth and the energy of a very young man, whatever. So I always think about that, of who the Bershom is picking. And I'll tell you why. Why would he pick an old man? who for 54 years never saw a Jew, because he was in Ethiopia the whole time and so on, you know? Because the Bershom didn't want you to think, well, the reason why this guy accomplished the task of taking the Jews out and getting him to Eretz Israel is because he's a young guy. So the Bershom took an old man, so you should know, believe me, it wasn't because of Moshe Rabbeinu, because you don't give that 
to an 80 year old man somebody who should have been retired at least 15 years ago to collect his social security check in any case that's just an aside you know uh, but so he picks Moshe Moshe comes to Paro and we know of course what happened Paro said well they're lazy right so therefore not only do they have to make the bricks right they have to go and gather the straw all around Egypt to make the bricks which means they didn't sleep because at night they have to gather straw believe me that wasn't easy because they had no flashlights right and then you can make the straw and then they make the bricks in the daytime that was a terrible terrible suffering you see <clears throat> so the question is of course why did the Bershom do that <clears throat> and so on so there are several reasons one of which is what I'm bringing this story all about and it bears on today and that's what we're seeing uh, what is it the first thing is that they did not deserve to be redeemed because the Sutton is screaming they don't deserve redemption they don't deserve a messianic era which is an unbelievable glorious era they don't deserve this because they're in the Memtashari Toma 49 levels of what of impurity and sinning and so on right mm. so how could you give these people this type of reward you see and that's the kitrug, the prosecution of the Sutton. So the Bersham said, I once spoke about this a long time ago. He said, you're right. I have to satisfy justice and take away your complaint, your prosecution, which he did. So he enormously intensified the suffering of the Jews to, to balance the books, so to speak, so that they should be deserved, basically, to be redeemed from Egypt. You see? So it's sort of like ketchup, where he was able to bring them to a level where they would deserve a redemption. So that's the first idea, is that it satisfies justice and removes the claim of the Sultan. But the second idea, which Chazal bring, by the way, is a vastly different idea, which is very important for us to know. What is that? And that is that, look, you know, the plagues hit Egypt, all of them. That means every Egyptian, as we know, was subject to the plagues, to the ten makas, right? It wasn't just on Paroi and his government and his house and so on. It was on the entire Egypt. So an Egyptian can say, what do you want from us? We didn't do it. We didn't enslave the Jews, right? So why do we deserve to get to this? to go through these markers, you see? So what the Russia want to reveal is that everybody, all Egyptians deserve the markers, and I will prove it to you. Uh, so what he did is because the Jews had to go all over Egypt to gather straw, they would have to go into a field belonging to an Egyptian. And what do you think that Egyptian would do? He'd tell the Jew, get off my property, right? Wait a minute, where's your Rachmanus, right? Because the truth is, all Egyptians hated Klai Israel. They were all anti-Semites, basically. Just that they never, they never had the opportunity to do what? To make the Jews suffer. But Pari was basically not only doing what he wanted, he was doing the, basically the will of the Egyptian nation. You see? So if that's the case, then they all deserve the Makas. Uh, that's called a Birur event. What a bira bira means to clarify, you see. What God wanted to clarify, right, is the guilt of the Egyptian people. So therefore, all of them would be deserving of the Makas. So that concept embraced two ideas. It satisfied the attribute of justice, so the Jews would deserve a messianic redemption. And the second thing is it concept of inclusivity it included all the Egyptians in the Marcus that they were also guilty because part of it was basically doing their will you see <clears throat> so that's called a bureau event the amazing thing is God used the same event for both ideas to punish the Jews satisfy justice and the second thing is to clarify why he's going to bring it on the entire Egypt you see, and so on. 
And as a result of that, they were all guilty of the makas. Therefore, we see, therefore, a very important idea, right? That when God does bring retribution, he's going to clarify in some event why they deserve definitely or specifically to have it also. That's a very important concept before retribution follows. There's also, by the way, another idea, you see, and what is that, you see? What that is that, believe it or not, you know, many people who are slaves do admire their masters. They have a certain attachment because they're so used to being slaves, especially if they get decent treatments. And we see that the Jews always claim many times when they're in the desert, you know, what you take us out for? You know, we enjoyed the food of Egypt. Apparently the, the uh, menu is pretty good or whatever, because why do they keep referring, you know, the whatever the gourds, the cucumbers, or whatever the aftiach, whatever they had in Egypt, you know? Uh, so there was some type of an attachment, an admiration for Egyptian culture, you see. So what God did, he had to mavaria. He says, wait a minute, I'll show you who these guys really are, right? Uh, they'll throw you off their land, right? What kind of, who are you admiring? These people are evil. So what he tried to do, and that's the third idea in this, is to destroy the admiration and the attachment that any Jew would have toward his Egyptian masters. It's also a very important idea. idea. He tried to loosen, you see, that attachment so they should want to leave Egypt, you see, and get ready for an exodus. That's part of the Cheshbon, as they say. That's part of the idea, you see. Now, that is a very important idea. <clears throat> Why? What, for what reason? Because one of the secrets, if you want to understand how the exile is going to end, right? How is it going to end and so on? Uh, it says in Kedusha of Musaf on Shabbos, Hine gu'alti eschem achris creatius. Behold, I will redeem you. Achris, the second redemption, which is the main redemption, creatius, like the first redemption. Uh, that means the redemption that's going to come now is basically in the same form as it happened in Egypt. You see? So therefore, just like in Egypt, there had to be a bureau event for these ideas to satisfy justice, to loosen the attachment, to get people ready, a mindset to leave, right? And to clarify why they deserve punishment. Just like it had to happen in the first Exodus redemption, it will also happen in a second redemption. And that is a very important clue as to what is happening now. And that's why I bring it down. You see, now really, there are, what we're looking at in many ways is a bureau, is a clarification, just like by Egyptians. There was a clarification. What is happening now in the entire world, right? It's not just Hamas, and it's not just the other Arab nations, right? But it's also Europe, and it's also the United States. You see, what God is showing you, basically, is something which is shocking. Jews are under some type of an illusion, you see. It's, it's hard to blame the Jews because they're so used to thousands of years of exile that, they, they, you know, they just commit foolish ideas. You see, many, many Jews, liberals or conservatives or wh whatever, are enamored from America. They love America, you know, uh, and so on. You know, they love the values, the culture, the traditions of, of, of America and so on, you know. And imagine if the Mashiach came tomorrow, all right? And all of a sudden, whoever this person is says, okay, we all of us now have to pick ourselves up and leave, you know? So what are the Jews gonna say? We leave, we don't wanna leave. We love America. We are patriots. 
So what do you mean leave, uh, from, uh, leave America? You know, America is a promised land. And believe me, many Jews think that, and so on. So they're, they're not going to do that. So what God has to show Jews, especially in America, because that you have five or six million Jews, what America really is, you see, <clears throat> and somehow to break the bond or the admiration that, uh, to loosen the attachment that a Jew has for America, you see, by revealing what America is really all about. And then to implant in the mind of the Jew, maybe this is not the promised land. Maybe I should leave, you see, and think about going to Eretz Israel, which obviously is the promised land, <clears throat> you see. <clears throat> so what God does is he takes an event and like I said, by Egypt, he has many different agendas in that event. Well, the agenda of this event, the war between Hamas and obviously Israel, has the concept of Biru in it. That's a very, very important idea. You see, <clears throat> you see. Now, there are many disturbing things. There are many disturbing things going on that really you have to wake up. Because we are looking at, in many ways, a dismal future. You don't realize that, and I want to bring this to your attention. Uh, first of all, there's a tremendous amount of anti-Semitic, uh, anti-Israel feelings in most of the universities in America. And I'm not talking about the universities that you never see or hear about. I'm talking about the Ivy League schools, you know, whether it be Harvard, Yale, Columbia, or whatever, or Princeton, or Stanford, and so on, you know. Uh, but I'm talking about the protests going on in all these universities, right, of a tremendous amount of people that are pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas. You see, that's terrible. Why? Because not only is it the defy logic, uh, because how, how can you can condone or agree with people that not only killed innocent people, you know, you know, a war is usually between two soldiers. But since when is it called a war, right? When you go in and you murder, right? Men, women, children, infants, elderly, are they supposed to be combatants? Uh, of course not. So how could you agree with the Palestinians in terms of what they've done? You see, or Hamas or whatever, in terms of what they've done. What the Russian has done is a favor to them by making the choice so obvious that how could you be anti-Semitic or anti-Israeli? And they still fail, you see. <clears throat> so that's the first wonder, is take a look at what they just did. They're subhuman. These people are not human beings. They're animals or subhuman, you see. So how could you even protest for them, even if you felt that way, you know, that the Arabs have a claim that justifies, but does it justify what they did? Uh, I mean, I've heard stories, which I'm sure everybody has, that you cannot believe that this is what they did, uh, you know, you can't believe, you know, you want to fight people, that's one thing, but what does that have to do with, like I say, women or children or infants? beheading infants, I don't want to go into, the, there's a lot of gore, it's terrible when you hear of what these guys did, you know, and so on. Uh, but how can you justify that or protest on their behalf? You, you're protesting on behalf of subhumans. You failed. And God has made it very obvious, very obviously as a choice what is going on. Yet you failed. I mean, just take a look at the hospital incident. Where, without, where they listen to Hamas. I mean, how do you listen to Hamas? We know that they lie, propaganda, and so on. So all the newspapers said, well, Israel blew up the hospital in Gaza. Huh? Uh, that doesn't even make sense. Because we know Israel is one of the greatest armies that always are careful about citizens and humanitarian and so on, you know. So that's number two. It, it, it's contrary to their behavior. 
Besides, how do you believe Hamas? Of course it was found out that this is not true, that it was a rocket misfire from Islamic Jihad. All right? And then there were people still claiming that. Um, it just shows you, uh, you know, what they do. You know, instead of saying, well, what Hamas do? Uh, why would they blow up? And then, of course, they found out that the hospital, underneath the hospital, is a headquarters of Hamas. Because they use citizens as shields. Why don't they protest against that? Uh, you see. And not only that, you find members of Congress are incredibly anti-Israel and anti-Semitic, right? Now, what's so dangerous about all this is that you want to know where this country's headed? All those colleges have youth, and this youth will grow up, right, and take prestigious jobs. This is the future of America. But wait a minute. If all these people are protesting for the Arabs, then what place is there for the Jew in America in the future? You know, we only have to wait about 10 years before this youth takes over the government, right? Or the corporations and so on, right? And then what's going to be? You see, and even if they find out that they were wrong, you see, but the fact that they did this without even thinking about it is very dangerous because it automatically is, a, is an opportunity that they had to arouse themselves for tremendous amount of anti-Semitism. Uh, you can't believe how dangerous that is for the Jewish people, what is going on in the colleges and universities across the entire America. I'm not even talking about all the progressives and the liberals, right, and the Democratic Party. Half the Democratic Party hate Jews. That's the, the statistic now, right? Uh, and they are one of the parties that in many ways leads America. So what hope is that for the future of American Jewry? People do not realize. In many ways, if you ask yourself, uh, you should check your calendar. Why? Because if you look at your calendar, you may expect to see the year 1933. But that's not the year, right? The year is what, 2023? But you look out and you see the fear in many Jewish people, you know, that they're madmen out there. It feels like 1933, when Hitler began his escapade, right? His destructive campaign against the Jewish people. Uh, so that is very worrisome, you see. But that's a bureau device. That is where God is showing us uh, what America can be, and what it is, and what it will be. That's what we begin to see. I know it's hard to accept, but that's what's happening. <clears throat> the second thing, you know, is, uh, and therefore, Jews are in love with America. What America, right? That's exactly what happened in Germany. Jews were in love with Germany, right? In the 20s and so on, you know, until they learned what Germans really are. Now, I'm not saying uh, that Americans are going to do what the Germans, I hope not, <clears throat> right? But nobody believed that it could happen in Germany, right? That type of nation, so prosperous and so educated. How could they burn Jews in the ovens, gas? Uh, you, you even hear that, gas the Jews in Australia, for instance, so on, you know? But that's how it always starts, in a milder way. That's exactly how it happened in 1933. So clearly, <clears throat> you know, this is an event not only to describe and to expose what America can do, but to, in many ways, remove the love affair that Jews have for America. Uh, so that's a bureau. Not only what America is, but what America easily can become. You see... <clears throat> The second thing which people don't realize, you see, is the government of the United States has committed unbelievable treachery. You see, not only that, they're all hypocrites. We don't realize the evil of the president, of Biden, uh, you know. How, how did this war begin, basically, right? Uh, it began because America has allowed Iran to become a very rich country, you see, and they have a tremendous amount of money, 
besides the money that America gives Iran, it's just hard to believe how could you sponsor this country and because of the money that they have, they give it to their proxies, right? Hezbollah, Hamas, and so on. In many ways, Biden has enabled this war. He has no idea what awaits him. Because, because he refuses, you know, there are sanctions that are legal now, all right, against Iran selling oil. But they, Biden does nothing. He allows Iran to sell oil. Uh, they used to be able to produce only 400,000 barrels. Uh, that's all. <clears throat> now they produce 3 million barrels. So they earn $2 billion a week. That's how much Iran is earning. Uh, so they used to have a certain amount of money. I think uh, the amount of money they used to have is like $4 billion, you know. Now they have $70 billion. Of course, they're flush with money. That's how they're able to sponsor, uh, you know, Hezbollah and Hamas. You know, these, these people have tremendous amount of weaponry. Where do they get the money for this? They, they don't, they're not engaged in businesses for this. Because Iran is giving them the money that Biden, uh, by legally, should stop. Uh, so God is looking at Biden, so to speak, and America. It's not just Biden. <clears throat> it's his administration, right? Blinken, Sullivan. All of them have an incredible amount of blood on their hands. This is treachery. And then Biden gets up and gives a speech about how much he, the, America will always consider Israel an ally. What do you mean an ally? How could you give and enable Iran to do this, right? And call Israel an ally? There's something that doesn't even make sense, right? That's enormous treachery, uh, you see. So you have to realize, you live in a government, basically, you live in a democracy that is really anti-Semitic. Tremendous anti-Semitism. That's what you live in. Uh, and so on, you see, you know. In any case, this is certainly one of the uh, ideas, <clears throat> you see. And as a result of that, Israel is facing an existential crisis. In any case, so what we see is a tremendous amount of treachery <coughs> in the American government. What I find to, is find to be astounding is the fact that I think 30 Americans have been killed by Hamas, you see, and not only that, American embassies are being threatened around the world, and there's still American hostages, uh, I think 500 in Gaza, and so on. Where is the dignity of America? Why does America allow Hamas to do that? I mean, if Trump was president, we, we can only begin to guess what he would have done to Hamas, to Hezbollah, and so on, and even to Iran, because they are the ones responsible. So where is this guy's honor about what they're doing to Americans? It, it just, it, 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 it's galling to view this administration, especially Biden, how he preaches about his loyalty to Israel, and meanwhile he's stabbing them in the back. Uh, but this is America. All right. So what are you doing? What are you falling in love with? Right? America that will stab you in the back. Right? And now they're telling Israel not to go into Gaza. Uh, you have any idea what these Hamas guys did to Israelis uh, in, in, uh, when they went into slaughter? Uh, and then Biden says, don't get be enraged. Is that what they did by 9-11? That America stopped their rage? or didn't go in. There's such hypocrisy here, such lies. It's just beyond belief, and so on. <clears throat> That's why I am very worried, <clears throat> because if the revolution, besides being mavarer, clarifying what America really is, what the government is, and what is going on in the entire world, you see, because the whole world should be enraged uh, at what Iran did, right, and the uh, Hamas and what Hezbollah is saying that they'll do. It just, it's hard to believe that the, uh, that the world is so impotent. 
Against what? A bunch of mullahs? They allow themselves to be hostage to a bunch of mullahs that insist on destroying the world? They should just go into Iran, right? And bomb the ports? And you bomb the oil fields? And that will set, set back Iran, right? At least 2,000 years. Th that's how far back it'll go, right? What's the big deal? Uh, but no, they allow themselves to be constantly subjected to fear of slaughter. And Iran still does it. I, I, I just find this incredulous that nobody cares. Where is the UN? In any case, uh, what I'm afraid of is that not only is this a bureau device, but I'm afraid that the Rabbanishim may act on that bureau device, which he did in Egypt. He destroyed Egypt. He allowed them to reveal themselves who they are. So that clarified justice. And then he wiped them out. You know, I, I hope it never happens, but unfortunately, you never know. Biden is allowing the border to be open. There are millions, eight million people that have crossed that border. A great deal of them are terrorists. We don't even know who they are. You see, who knows if there's not a group of them plotting to do another 9-11, which is very likely, you know, because there already are attacks against the U.S., the embassies, and Biden does nothing. You see, he comes across as an old man, foolish, you see, long depleted of any intelligence that he had at one time. You never know. And Biden has open borders, which is unheard of. Not only does he break the, the immigration law, but how could you do that? You know how dangerous that is? Because we live in such a dangerous world. It's just incredible. I'm telling you, you can't make this stuff up. That's how bizarre it is. So you never know. There could be another 9-11. And that will be the punishment that comes after the Bureau, which is interesting. Now, what is also important to know <coughs> is one of the Bureau devices that God uses, and most people don't look at it that way, but that's really what it is, is the war of Goig and Mogoig. There's a guy, Goig, from the land of Mogoig, who unites the world against Israel against the Jewish people in the land of Israel. You see? Why? Well, what that really is, is a resurgence of evil. Because it's a messianic war in the end. But there are many parts to that war. Goig and Mogog is not one single war. It has several parts. Because what God does is he wants to minimize or diminish the amount of Br br brutality that will take place in the war of Goig and Mogoig. You see, mm, uh, in Egypt, Goig and Mogoig is what? It's Paroi coming after the Jews by the Kriyas Yamsuf, by the Yamsuf to destroy the Jews. And of course, he was destroyed. It's, the re it's really the resurgence of evil because they see their way of life as ending. <coughs> so it's what's called the last stand. But Goig and Mogog really comes really toward the end. But it can be divided. In fact, it is divided. The Chofetz Chaim held that World War I is Goig and Mogog, right? World War II is the second part of Goig and Mogog. And then he said there's a third part of Goig and Mogog. But any war where you have the entire world, in many ways, against the Jewish people, is a part of Goig and Mogoig. They contribute. Where do you see this? Because Chizkiyohu, when he was surrounded by Sancherev, Assyria, right? With 183,000 soldiers. So what the Russian wanted to do is allow them to be called Goig and Mogoig because they wanted to wipe out the Jews and Chizkiyohu would be the Mashiach. Whatever reason it didn't happen, because Cheskiyot failed to sing Shira, right? That the next day, all 183,000 soldiers were dead, which is an open miracle, incredible. And he didn't sing Shira to God for doing that open miracle. So God said it cannot be now. But what you do see is that could have been Goig and Magog. Again, because it's a tremendous amount of the world against the Jewish people. Well, this war certainly does that, because like I said, there's Goig and Magog in terms of, right, 
uh, the world having protests for Hamas, right? All the supporters for Hamas. How many people in America and around the world, London, whatever, Australia, whatever, Europe, right, that are protesting for Hamas? This, no question, even though it involves Yishmael, which are the Arabs, the Muslims, right, it certainly can qualify as one of the parts, right, of Goyg and which I believe it is, by the way, you know. So what, what's interesting about that is that that means that if it is part of Goyg and we are very close to the end. That's what we, we clearly see, and so on, you know. So I believe that what we are seeing now is part of Goyg and Mogoyg because it is a, a union, a unity of all the Umar Sa'ilam against the Jewish people. Because you see that clearly demonstrated in all the protests that is happening for on the side of Hamas. You see, <clears throat> well, you do see also something. We will not know the repercussions of this until the end. God has destroyed the myth of Israeli invincibility. And he just wiped it out. I mean, how Mossad, you know, uh, the Shabak or whatever, how they could make such an incredible error, mistake, uh, just beyond belief, how uh, and organizations that are wanted to be so sophisticated intelligence have missed this. And because they missed this, right, and it's not just that they missed what the Arabs were planning for a year or whatever, right, but they, they missed also a thousand people crossed that border, terrorists, Hamas, crossed the border and killed, mutilated in a terrible way, right, 1,400 Jews. So in many ways, th their error is grievous. And like I said last, uh, last uh, week and so on and so forth, you know, the unbelievable foolishness of the government, which, which includes Netanyahu and his Likud and so on. I, somebody told me that only a couple of months before this, they took away all the guns from the people in the south, near Gaza. You believe this? So they left them defenseless. You see, those people who did have guns were saved. Obviously, because the Arabs did not want to, Hamas didn't want to fight guys who have guns. All those people were, who didn't have guns were sitting ducks. They all died. So can you imagine, how could you take a gun away from somebody that is surrounded by enemies? You left them defenseless. But what right did you have to do that when he's surrounded by enemies? Uh, I mean, you talk about negligent homicide. It's unbelievable, right? They were all guilty of negligent homicide because they were surrounded by the enemy, Hamas, in Gaza, and you took away their guns. What kind of logic is that? You see? And not only that, how do you allow Hezbollah to have 150,000 missiles aim at Israel and do nothing? They sat there for years arming themselves, and they say one-third of those missiles are precision-guided. Hezbollah is a much more formidable army than Hamas. How could you allow them to gather missiles, 150,000 missiles? They say that can overwhelm the entire Iron Dome in a couple of hours and leave Israel completely defenseless. Imagine they would fire 7, 10, 12, 13,000 missiles, and that's the end of the Iron Dome. You see, and then what happens to the, then they'll fire on Tel Aviv, they can destroy Israel just from 150,000 missiles. It's incredible. So how do you allow them to gather missiles for years and do nothing? What kind of a cheshbon is that? It's suicide. You see, people who want to commit suicide do that. But it's not like Israel didn't have the ability or the manpower to stop it. But they didn't. They let them do it, you see. And they let Iran get away with this. They're just playing ping pong with these monsters. And God wanted to show them, you think you're dealing with people? These are subhumans. So how could you allow them? It's only a matter of time until they kill you. So where is your responsibility 
to the Israeli people, to the Jewish people, in terms of what will happen. It's only a matter of time. So how could the government do that? As far as I'm concerned, that's pure negligent homicide to be aware of this and so on, you know. So I th I w we have yet to see what will happen after uh, the war is over, what they're going to do with this Israeli government for allowing this and so on. Now there's something I wanted to talk about which is very important and I'll end with this concept. People are walking around and saying to themselves, well, what do we do? If this is a case, if this is a bureau device, right? Where you, see the, uh, where you see what's happening in America, around the world, you see the hatred of Jews, the anti-Semitism, which has been growing tremendously. And now you see it openly by the demonstrations. Many Jews are walking around and they're frightened. They don't go out of their house or whatever. And the problem is, you think this is going to go away? No. Because even if the war ends, which of course it will someday, right? <clears throat> Once you've aroused, once a person has come in contact with his hatred of Jews, even if it becomes dormant, it's still there. It's only a matter of time till it flares up again. That's what people don't understand. Anti-Semitism doesn't go away. It just goes down and becomes dormant for the next time it gets aroused. This is the problem. Once it's been aroused, right, then it will lie dormant. So America, therefore, will always be, be in certain ways, an anti-Semitic nation. We see it openly, as I've said, with the government, right, and with the people, and so on. So then how do you protect yourself? And I'd like to give you a way that a person can incredibly protect himself. You know, and it's, and it's something which uh, clearly stated. What is the most potent and powerful weapon ever used to protect yourself from any harm? And the answer is Shmir Saloshim. Right. What is Shmir Saloshim? It means to guard against communicating certain types of information. Now, that information is basically Lashon Hara. <clears throat> Any kind of information that will harm another Jew in several ways, and there are three types. One type is where you degrade another person, you demean him, you destroy his reputation, or you, da or you harm his reputation. I call that LH1, Lashon Hara 1. Then there's Lashon Hara 2. If you damage a person financially, <coughs> right? or uh, you uh, emotionally disturb him by pointing out his flaws, right? And becomes emotionally uh, anxious and so on. That is also Lashon Hara, but it is called LH2, damaging. And then there's LH3, Lashon Hara 3, and that's if you cause animosity from a person. You, let's say you're speaking to somebody and you say, do you know what that man, Ruvain, let's say, said about you? So automatically the listener will hate Ruvain, called the target character and so on. That's Lashon Hara 3. Three types of Lashon Hara. The common denominator is that all of them will harm another Jew. That is forbidden to communicate. And to communicate means three things. One, you cannot speak it. Number two, you cannot listen to it. And number three, you cannot believe it. You can suspect that maybe it's true, but you cannot believe it definitively or absolutely. Uh, now, it is forbidden to engage in Lashon Hara. Why? Why is it so serious? And I will show you how serious it is. Because the uh, Sutton is always trying to prosecute you for your many sins. It's always going on. Uh, but he can only do so if you talk Lashon Hara, measure for measure. It's called dinam, justice. If you condemn somebody else, if you harm somebody else, then God gives permission to the Sutton, the heavenly district attorney, to condemn you. And that's called a kitrug. You see, the amazing thing is that if you do not speak Lashon Hara, he cannot prosecute you. It's astounding. You actually stop 
the heavenly district attorney, the heavenly prosecutor. That's the rule. He can only prosecute you in heaven, and that's the only time you're ever punished when he prosecutes, if you speak, listen, or believe Lush and Hara. If you don't, it is incredibly difficult for him. Therefore, there are two ways to protect yourself. And everybody is only giving you one way. I'm telling you a way which is incredibly powerful. And not only powerful, but historically, it's probably the greatest weapon of all, device. Okay? Uh, because if you do not speak or listen or believe Lashon Hara, then the Sultan cannot macatrate, prosecute you. And the only way you can be harmed in any way, financial, bankruptcy, divorce, sickness, I don't care what it is, is if you speak Lashon Hara. <coughs> because then it goes in front of the heavenly tribunal and he condemns you, the Sultan, and then of course, if you are deserving, you will be punished. But what happens if you don't speak Lashon Hara? then the Sultan basically cannot prosecute you. But then what happens to the sins that you did? And the answer is, it's between you and God. You do not have to appear in front of a heavenly tribunal. God judges you. But since he doesn't have to defend his actions, right, in a court of heaven, he can do whatever he wants in that sense. So what he will do is wait and not punish you. Or and just send you warnings, or he can do it over a long period of time, or he could do it to your property and not to you. You see, he can introduce mercy that you don't deserve because you're not in a court of heaven where he has to defend his actions against the Sutton, you see, which is the angel of justice. In any case, that's the most powerful weapon of all. Now, there are two ways to protect yourself. Certainly even from anti-Semitism. One way of being harmed by anti-Semitism, one is to have a schus, to take on some type of mitzvah, merit, which is what everybody's saying, which is true. You learn Torah, right? Uh, you know, you put on tefillin, you observe Shabbos. There's no question that these are very valuable because you're hoping that the merit, in the merit of adopting committing to a mitzvah, that merit will protect you against a prosecution. But I want to tell you something. Really? The most powerful way of protecting yourself is get rid of the prosecution. Don't even bother with this guy. You see? So it's, of course it's true that you should not, you should take on a mitzvah, right? Very true. But the real way to protect yourself is don't go to court. Don't hire or allow the heavenly district attorney, the prosecuting angel, to even condemn you in court. And he can't if you don't talk Lashonara, or listen, or believe. That's obviously the most powerful way. Where do you see this? People do not realize what the mitzvah of Shmir Salashan is. And I will show you, okay? Why did the Jews get out of Egypt? Most people don't know. Whatever going into the whole thing. But the Medrash Rabbah says three times, The only reason why the Jews were what? Were freed from Egypt? Because there was no one who spoke Lush and Hara. That's why. It's astounding. It says three times in the Medrash. The reason why they got out of it is because they did not speak Lush and Hara so that the Gesotten could not condemn them or prosecute them to remain in slavery. So they actually got out of Egypt. Do you have any idea what kind of a milestone that is? To get out of hundreds of years of slavery by not speaking Lush and Hara? Why? Because they quieted the prosecution. That's number one. I could go on, but I'm just being brief. Second idea, okay? We know that we blow 100 koilis for the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, 100 times, right? Uh, so the Ramchal says, why? So he says the first 30 is a kapora, right? Is an atonement for gilia rias, for incest, adultery. The second 30, right? is a kapora for shvichas domim, for murder. And the third 
section, which is 30 koilas, each one is 30, 30 koilas, 30 blasts, right, is because of Aved Zorah. Fine, okay, that's 90. What about the last 10? Right, so we've enumerated three sins out of the 613 possible sins. Uh, that leaves us with another 610 as eligible candidates for the last 10. Right? And not only that, if it's part of the shoifa, we can imagine it's the most serious of all the sins. And you know what it is? Ramchal says, Lashon Hara. Those ten blasts have to cover for the sins of the Jews who spoke Lashon Hara. Could you believe this? That's unbelievable. That's how powerful Lashon Hara. Now, third idea. The coin Gadol on Yom Kippur. The coin Gadol basically the holiest man in Israel, right, went into the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the Holy of Holies, which is the holiest place, on Yom Kippur, the holiest day. And he did several things. One of which, which was the main thing, by the way, is he offered incense, Keteris, in the Holy of Holies. So the question is, wait a minute, if the holiest man on the holiest day, in the holiest place, did this, what was that for? Well, obviously, it was for kapora, for an atonement. Yeah, but which sin? And the answer is, Lashon Hara. The Kohen Gadol, the holiest man, on the holiest day, Yom Kippur, right? In the holiest place, right? The Holy of Holies, where you had the Oroin, that was so holy, even if a malach, an angel, could not fly through that room. Only the Kohen Gadol could go there, right? Basically, once a year. What did he do? He did what? He burnt Keteris, which is the incense, right? Why? Because Klai Yisrael most of all needed a kapora for all the lush and horror and invoking the Sutton that they've done. I've just given you three incredible incidents. Why they get out of Egypt? Why you have 10 blasts of 100 blasts on Rosh Hashanah, which shows you the importance. And on Yom Kippur, why they offered incense. Could you believe this? And not only that, I will tell you. It's a medrash, chazal. And here's what it says. Omer HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God says. Listen to this. Remember, this is God talking. Uh, I could save you. God says this. I can save you. Me cold sorrow from any problem right any difficulty <coughs> any harm ubavad on one condition that you do not speak Lashon Hara God says this do you don't think God can protect you from anybody of course he can and he says himself you want to be protected against all harm don't talk Lashon Hara that prevents the Sutton from prosecuting you and I'll tell you one more, because there's so many more, right? Where it says Achav, he was the king of Israel, right? He's in the Navi, for 40 years, and he had many wars. But it says that in all the wars of Achav, they never lost a battle. Never lost a battle. Why? Was it because of his incredible strategy, ability? No. Because it says in that generation, doesn't say why, but it says in that generation, nobody spoke Lush and horror. So therefore there were no prosecutions. No prosecutions, nobody dies. Nobody's harmed. <clears throat> so listen carefully. <clears throat> if you want to be saved from everything you see going around you, you can have two directions. Everybody's telling you something which is true and very important. Take on a mitzvah. But commit to the mitzvah, which means you have to want to do it and you have to learn the laws of that mitzvah. So that's a schus, tremendous schus. And do it for yourself and also that the Jewish people should be saved from this existential threat. Uh, that's one way. But what I'm telling you is a different idea. Don't talk Lush and Hora. Why? Because Lush and Hora is what provokes the Sutton to to prosecute you. So th the greatest way is don't go to court. Then nothing happens to you. Which is incredible. 
So you don't have to rely on the fact, well, the fact that I take on a mitzvah, let's say, at tzitzis, right? Will that protect me? Hopefully it will. But the best way to do it is not to have a commitment to do a mitzvah against harm that somebody's plotting to do against you. The best way to do it, right, is don't get involved with the sudden. Don't let them prosecute you in court. Right? Isn't that logical? And the way to do that is Shmir Haloshim. <clears throat> Be very careful. Take on the mitzvah, right, of Shmir Haloshim, guarding your, your, guarding your uh, not to, uh, to uh, communicate forbidden information, right? Uh, and learn the halachas. Learn, join the group that has two halachas a day. And I'm telling you, you don't realize that. Not only will it protect you from harm, but it will also send you Yeshua's. It will send you salvations, whether it be Shidduch, whether it be uh, uh, health, right? Anything, business, whatever. Take on this mitzvah, because this is really, in many ways, and now that I've explained it, is the greatest single protection you can ever have. It's astounding, and it's an incredible chesed that we can control our appearance in court in the heavenly tribunal uh, you see so take that on and um, uh, th that's the main idea do that and you'll see that you will be protected no matter what the threat is it, all of it is irrelevant to God he will protect you thank you <laughs>